gentlemen, we got a special guest here in the Just Acting Up show from the Red Box. This, sir, I always love working with this gentleman. Bradley Smith, give him a hand. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me here. Appreciate oh. it. Oh, man. We appreciate you, man. Bradley, what is up, man? How you doing this morning? Doing, doing great. Great. Enjoying the weekend. Just diving in there. Uh, yeah, I've been doing a little a little uh, editing, a little um, working on some side stuff here, but uh, having a good time. Always doing that hustle, you know. Yes, sir. I, hey, man, I know it, man. And I always appreciate you for everything, man. When you do send stuff to me or just ever, or just working with you, period, man. Yeah, always a pleasure. Oh, yeah. It's always fun being on set, dude. You're, you are you're a light on set. You're, you're definitely a memorable presence, too. Oh, man. Like you're, a guy, you're a guy when you leave set, you're like, I like that guy. I hey man, I, I try to <laughs> aim for that, man. I try to, man. Yeah, man. Let's uh but yeah, dude, let's let's go ahead and get into it, man. So let's talk. Um what got you started on your journey? Let's talk about your humble beginnings. What got Bradley started? Uh okay. Well, uh that'd be that'd be school theater, fair enough. Um it's I feel like it's always an easy way to get into acting for a lot of people is you try it out at your theater elective. Um I kind of just did it at first because my brother and sister were doing it and they seemed to be moderately okay at it. So I was like, I want to do that. And I did it in middle school and was getting lead and speaking roles and doing all right there in theater and continued to do it in high school and got more reaffirmation that I'm pretty good at it there. Um, and yeah, I was I I was never a good at musical theater though. I was not singing is not my forte. Never will be probably, <laughs> but the just acting and saying words and faking emotion, I guess I'm pretty good at that. Um and after doing theater all throughout high school, I kind of realized um I guess theater, unfortunately, unless you're in like New York or you're just really have a good connection and can do that sort of thing, it's just not where money is. So I had to find different avenues for acting which is how i said well i love anime and i love cartoons let me get myself a voiceover reel and and the summer i left high school i even said i've never done it before it'd be weird i should try to find a film to audition for and i auditioned for uh, a local film um it was called it was called something different at the time and now it's called walk by faith but um it's a great, uh, great, great film. Uh, Trina Brown uh, and Lamarcus Tinker were the people who worked on that. Um, it, they, they casted me, uh, and it was like a paid role right out of high school, and it was my first thing I ever auditioned for, and it kind of made me go, "Okay, I'm going to take this as a sign that I should pursue this more." And ever since then, I have taken it seriously as like, "Okay, let's." Take this as more of a hobby, more than just a school elective, and now I now I'm calling myself an actor, like it's my job, because nice. it is my job. <laughs> yes. how, how was that moment, that first time you seen yourself on screen? Like, what was that feeling like? Oh yeah, oh man, I'm, uh, especially in my high school days, because that was when I had the role. Uh, okay, uh, I, I was, uh, I was a f fat kid growing up. I wasn't even that big i was like 250 pounds but i was bullied about it in middle or middle school and high school and it was something that i was self-conscious about and so i i was i hated seeing myself on screen at the time because i was like oh i'm so not i'm not good looking i wasn't like the oh uh, yeah i wasn't the uh love interest i was the school bully too so it just i mean it worked i i too i i wasn't supposed to look flattering so i guess it works for the film but I was definitely like, oh gosh, I don't. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not leading man material right there. Um, but I, I guess I enjoyed it. Uh, I'll, I'll say, in that first film, the editor did use a take of me one time. It was my first film. I watched the film with a bunch of my friends, and they go, "Did you just look into the camera?" <laughs> and I go, no, they didn't use that take, did they? And there's like this montage scene in this library. And I remember them telling me, they went, oh, Bradley, you looked into the camera. I went, oh, dang it. It's that, it's that thing when you're fresh into acting right. and you just 
Don't look in the camera. Don't look in the camera. Hi, camera. Then, no, I did it. It's still great. You look right into the camera. <laughs> and then they used that take, but they had other takes. And I'm like, no, it was a small production. So it's like, I, you know, smaller. So you can't, can't blame them for those things. But it just made me laugh because I'm like, I mean, I did it. Um, that's a memory of my first film. They oh, use the take when I'm giving the camera a good old hi there. Is, that is, it, wall. is it is it just me but when they tell you they stress it so much don't look into the camera it's like a part of you want to look into the camera uh-huh. <laughs> like, you're like challenge accepted yeah, like, like, uh, <laughs> don't tell me what to do yeah, like, but that's the rule no yeah no 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 don't look into the camera do you like i want to look into the camera <laughs> and ferris bueller <laughs> break the fourth wall yeah exactly yeah too funny, too funny, man. So tell us a little bit, going to your voiceover. Now, of course, you know, we were all kids growing up watching silly cartoons or whatever. Yeah. What was that first cartoon that you was like, you know what, I'm going to try this voice out and, you know, I'm, I'm going to get into this voiceover stuff. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, I did I did Boy Scouts growing up, and a lot of that is just being silly with with random kids of all different ages some older some younger which which it it put everyone on an even playing field like you were all just kind of being silly and so sitting around a campfire and singing like silly weird owl songs and that sort of thing would just get you started into being goofy and then i remember we'd get into it was like early meme culture of like quoting shows you were just saying your favorite random quotes and I remember a couple of kids were telling me it was one of those things where you unintentionally do something. And I'm that person where people go, ha, that was really funny. And I, I go, ha, I want to be funny. Please tell me how I did that. And then they go, no, you're never, you're not being funny. Now you're trying too hard. And I'm going, no, <laughs> so I can never be the most funny as I want to. It's like, it's always when I'm not trying, which is why you got to work to not try. But right. uh, I, someone, they, at the time they went, Hey, you did a really good SpongeBob voice because I was also pretty prepubescent, so my voice was higher and I was sounding like SpongeBob. And I remember just that that whole like camp out kind of doing a bunch of different SpongeBob lines, and that was like all the kids going, "Oh, say this one, say this one is SpongeBob," basically because it sounded like a repeat. And I remember that was probably the first time me going, "Oh, that was kind of fun to do do a character voice," even though it was um, an imitation and everything. I still was like, I mean, I know that's a difficult voice to pull off and um obviously i was an actor at the time so I, it was just fun to get that kind of confirmation but um ever since then as i've gotten older funny enough i've learned doing imitations can sometimes be a great way to discover other voices you can do because your mm-hmm. imitation is usually at least for me i'm awful at impersonation and so whenever i say oh i'm sounding like this people will go no you don't but exactly now it sounds like a completely unique thing to myself so it's kind of it's kind of a works in my way where i can try to imitate someone and it won't sound like that but hey now i got a new unique bradley voice over here (laughs) so i kind of i've kind of done that with spongebob with uh you know before where it's like oh i can't hit spongebob but hey i'll try to do spongebob and that'll be a character for me so yeah put that one right back into your your pocket of like okay that character voice works for this one, and that one works for that one. I love that, man. That's yeah. dope. You know what's cool about a uh, voiceover? It doesn't matter how old you are. You you uh, you can if you have a unique voice, you can play like an eight year old, like your yep. voiceover eight year old. So yep. I, I thought that's pretty cool because I have a very light voice. I'm a big guy, but my voice is very light. And so when I used to call like customer service, they always would say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And I'm like, I am a guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. And so, so someone, or so, some, someone once told me, they're like, man, listen, your voice is unique and you should use it. So I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's right. Mm-hmm. I'm cool with that's, that. that's actually, yeah, the strongest rule that voice actors always like to like uh, whenever I was going around to conventions and stuff before the pandemic, obviously, and going to like voice actor panels, one of the things I'd always he- heard preached is like the best voice you can do is your natural voice. Who can do right. that better than you? So find that your the way you have to do it is you just have to be honest with yourself, try to close your eyes, listen to your own voice and, or get other people to listen to your natural voice and say, what kind of character do you hear 
when you just listen to my voice, like, you know, and try to figure out where your natural voice works. So you're also not going, ah, look, listen, I'm, I am eight year old. I am, you know, eight year old little Timmy. <laughs> like you're saying like, oh, it's like some of the higher voice, like you, it's like, you could play like a natural, like teenager or something, you know, you're like, oh, right. sweet. I kind of have just a not higher natural range. My right. like deeper range. I like got told like in theater and stuff. Oh, you're, you've got a great father voice. And I'm like, okay. I I was so not a a strongly masculine guy. I was just like, it's very weird to be called fatherly and like fatherly, (laughs) fatherly, (laughs) like fatherly. Yeah, no, but I yeah, I was always getting that. Just like, okay, we're gonna cast you as the dad or the older guy, and I'm like, okay. Theater. That was how that was how that worked in high school theater. You know, you can cast uh. Just your biggest, oldest kind of kid. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about your role with the series Redbox. Could you share a little bit about that with us? Sure. So I'm playing Ruben. I've been I've been on the production since Redbox Two, by the way. Uh, we're doing we did Redbox Two, Redbox Part Three, Redbox. We're working Redbox Four right now. That's what we're doing. And um, we got some interesting stuff going on with my character. So I'm the music producer of uh, this uh, group that's come across the red box and I'm, I'm the, I'm the comedic relief, random mm-hmm. chance character in that. I, I totally was just like um, a, a, a hired person to help work on the, their music. But because uh, this whole red box stuff happened around the same time as they were working on their music, my character, he it was kind of, kind of drunk too he just thought it all sounded fun and crazy and he just tagged along for the ride because music music life rock and roll and he followed them uh and got himself into a heap of trouble that he didn't expect guns and death um a lot a lot of crazy stuff going on and um uh this one he's uh my character is sober now too he's kind of come to clean up his life mm-hmm. but uh because he because wa- he wants to take the music more seriously and he realizes with all the crazy stuff going on with red box with the red box um he yeah he just being drunk and uh uncoordinated is not the way to go uh he's found christ again and there's gonna be yeah uh, there's gonna be a big party scene he's kind of celebrating his sobriety mixed with uh, the music event funny enough he's gonna get everyone else drunk and high to celebrate him not getting drunk and high because it's about being able to make the choice and being around it <laughs> so yeah he's gonna have a big party and that's gonna be uh where the finale of this of this shtick sort of takes place is we're gonna have a big mansion party scene type dealy maybe not mansion but we'll see Nice, nice, man. Yeah, when I was watching it, um, when it came out, I was like, oh, I'm like, I was excited because I saw multiple multiple people that I've worked with. I'm like, oh, Bradley's in this too, and I was like, that's pretty funny. Oh man, <laughs> it was just a really cool scene. I enjoyed it. And I watched it, and I was gonna ask you, what has been so far besides the Red Box? What has been your favorite role to date right now? Okay. As he sips his drink, <laughs> think about that one. Um, okay, my favorite role to date. Um, it's just funny because I guess one of them is like it's it's a it's a short that never came out. Um, oh, dang. Yeah, oh. but I'll tell I'll tell you all about it because it's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I got one scene from it, and boy, it was like the most. An interesting scene from my part, but uh, it's the only proof I have that the film exists. So, a few years back, oh. I, di- I got an audition for a film that was up in Austin, um, and it was paid. It was like 100 bucks a day. It was like, oh, U- UT Austin, which is why I liked it, because I know them, you know, they got good film uh, college and stuff. So, I was like, hey, yeah, let's get in with some good uh, young film people. Um, and uh, so... I got and I got hired for uh, I ended up getting the lead role in this film 
and I got hired to do like six days. So I was going to be doing like six days up in Austin, making like 600 bucks. It was like my biggest paycheck in like one lump for like a gig at the time. So I was like, yeah, I'm making 600 bucks. Hell yeah. I was like feeling really, really on my high horse. I, um, and this film, the best way I could, I could put it, my elevator pitch is, is it's a vomit vampire film. Mm. It is a film about vampires who feed off vomit. Oh, uh, wow. Yes, and that's yeah, it's very strange mm. of a concept. Here, <laughs> but the short, it was well written and actually like I was like, okay, I can get on this, and it wasn't too grotesque like this kind of stuff could be. Uh, but um. So the, the, it starts with like my character in a bar and I'm just like some uh, meek, meek guy who's just looking for a girl and I end up coming across this mysterious girl and she tells me to like eat this thing and basically it makes me pass out. And then when I wake up, I'm in a cage and I'm in this creepy warehouse and uh, like they, we had even, we had this big, big guy get naked and he was in the cage acting like a dog person. And it was like really, uh, they were like, they had some funny stuff going on with that little setting but uh uh i end up t uh basically this female vampire comes out and forces me to feed as she, she like feeds me stuff and then forces me to vomit and there was like a scene of stuff coming out of my mouth and like going into her mouth i i think at one point there was even like a vomit kiss um it was oatmeal and like chocolate and stuff. It was like very actually not bad at all what the vomit was made out of the fake vomit. It was one of those tricks where like, damn, this looks good, but it did not when you're when you had it in your mouth, you're like, this isn't bad. Okay. It's not yeah. vomit, so it made it easy. But really all the vampires needed to do was just hang out at the club. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh and, we they ended up having like a prosthetic head um for this sh they had a shot where like this head vampire the main vampire came in and uh my character i kind of convinced the female vampire to betray him and i end up getting a crossbow and i shoot this chandelier that falls down and it bursts his head and they had a fake like head that we it was like a one take thing where it's like all right we're gonna break this thing and it's gonna be our one take and they did all that six days seemed like a really cool film cool concept like it's gross but different it stands right. out um mm -hmm. and then they just and they never finished editing it and i was like oh man That's and i kept awesome. begging them for footage begging them for footage and they sent me one scene and it's like a scene when i'm in a cage talking with this other guy and it's more about the other guy and so i'm like ah I got all the shots. Could have got me with the crossbow. Could have got me getting knocked out at the club. Could have got. I was like all the stuff. This I got. I'm just sitting here talking to the cage. I was like, oh. Okay. It's like after all, after all that, I can't stand. Man, that's. Yeah, well, we we've been on you know sets like that mm -hmm. where we're like we did all this and all that work, and then we like that was pretty crazy. Good. I use as a footage, mm -hmm. and then you just like never see. It. Yeah. 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 Yep. yep. It happens. Uh. More often than not, hey, now it's happening with HBO Max, just straight, <laughs> straight oh up my God. canceling their movies. Can oh you imagine my. being on that level and getting told, yeah, no, we're not going to have that come out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a show that I had got into. Uh, I just seen one episode, and I'm like, man, I, I, I'm I, enjoying the show. And then, like, I want to say, like, two weeks later, they, they said that they're not coming out with another season. So I'm like, what's the point of me finishing – the, oh, I hate that. That happens so often now, though. Yeah. One yeah. season. Hey, you want to love this show for 13 episodes? Well, <laughs> so that's that. all we're going to give you. Right. Oh, I literally my. always wait now before getting into a show. I try to wait and see if it's going to get renewed for a season two. Same. Before, yeah. Same here. Same here. So, yeah, man, only a couple more quick questions. Um, let's talk about your YouTube channel real quick, because I know you YouTube as well, too. Um, you do skits and everything else. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that real quick. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so I do. Um, I got my own personal YouTube channel, just got my own name, Bradley Smith. And mm -hmm. um, on there, yeah, I'd, I started it a little over a year ago uh, with just the intention to highlight my 
I guess, comedy and writing, just kind of whatever I found interesting. I didn't really have um, a set goal and I still kind of don't. I'm trying to find a little more of a, a niche, but it's always hard to do. Uh, so I started doing like movie, comedic movie reviews just on objectively bad films, like really terribly animated stuff. Um, and uh, I've I've done a couple sketches. Um, it's like classic sketch comedy. I'm wanting to do more of them. It's just difficult because I, I like working with other people. Right. And, uh, it's just hard getting all those moving pieces together. Right. Like, with everything in life, I'm just I I always spread myself <laughs> too thin. But um, uh, on my YouTube channel, other than just movies, I also roast. Uh, I've roasted a movie trailer was the biggest thing I've done was this Pinocchio, a true story uh, with Polly Shore as the mm. Pinocchio. I, I I reacted to that trailer and that video for me hit over a million views, which is insane. Oh. It's like my only one that's hit anywhere close to that. It's mind boggling for me. And uh, the only reason that happened, I've kind of f figured it out now, was that the main trailer itself of the, the Polly Shore Pinocchio trailer turned off its comments. And so everyone went to the next video, which ended up being mine, to go comment and, and say all their funny stuff they wanted to. So I kind of got all the meme lords coming to my, I was like, thank you, internet. Give, give my channel some love. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then other than that, I've also, I, I, cause I, I guess I don't want to just make my, I didn't want to make my channel just, um, negative. I wanted to show some love. So I have some positive wow. videos with still a comedic tone. Uh, I did a video on like Max Keeble's big move. Uh, cause that was just one of my favorite movies as a kid. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm going to give some love to that. Um, and then I've started making video essays on cartoons that I really enjoyed. My first one being on the old what is it wb or um uh adult swim cartoon of the oblongs i remember that show oh i love that i love that Me show. too i i i literally just kind of wrote like an english video uh, like an english essay about the oblongs and why i liked it and its characters and put out a video so i flipped that video so quick i remember it seemed so effortless and that one for me is also it's like my second biggest video. It's got like 300,000 views. Um, mm. appar apparently Oblongs was going viral on Twitter at the time uh, <laughs> because people are, people sexualize one of the characters apparently. Uh, yeah. I did not know about that at all until yeah. going into the video. Everyone's like, I love Creepy Susie. I'm like, a lot of Creepy Susie fans for some reason. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think I that, that was before Rick and Morty. Yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Way before Rick and Morty. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It was yeah, classic, classic show. I love it. And um funny enough too, uh the the creator of the show, Angus Oblong, uh, because mm -hmm. I, I like talked about him in my video because I mean, how are you not gonna talk about the creator of the show? And the dude has like kept himself very hidden. Uh and so mm -hmm. uh he does has not made himself a very public presence. So it was very mysterious and interesting. He actually yeah. reached out to me on Instagram because I like commented on one of his Instagram posts, and then he ended up going like Hey, you're that cool guy that made the video about me. And I'm like, ah, I was seen by by him. So okay. yeah, that was really cool. He, he even I even got recognized by the creator of the show. So that, that was very satisfying. That's dope, man. Well um, and, and yeah, that gives you a good scope of kind of my channel. Exactly. I do a lot on my channel. It's all <laughs> over the place. I love it too though. So uh my last question here is is now you're a screenwriter, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you handle like roadblocks or when you have like when you're stumped? Like when you how do you get over those things? Uh as mm. a Okay, uh yeah, that's always always the I mean obviously it is. It's called a roadblock or writer's block in that way. Yeah, obviously it's gonna be the hard part is is getting stumped. Um I tend to uh there's a couple things I do. I guess at first my short, if I'm really wanting to keep working on whatever I'm working on and I'm like, I don't want to just take a break, you know, and either work on something else or take my mind off it. I sometimes have to kind of do uh, like that improv game of uh, 
where it's like uh, something else where you have to rethink your idea. I take, I step back a scene or two and, um, or a page of dialogue, whatever, whatever I'm working on. And I go, is this really the path that I want to take this? Is this really the best route? Was this the right route? Like, why am I hitting this block? Why, why do I not feel as passionate about writing as I did before? Sometimes, sometimes you just like, cause um, a lot of writing for me, I, like um, I'm working on a feature film right now and it's just been a, cra a crazy journey. Cause I, for me, it was a lot of preparation of listening to YouTube videos and thinking about working on a film. And I kind of said, well, I'm never going to work on it until I actually sit down and work on it. So I have to turn mm -hmm. a blank page and actually writing. And so I just started doing it one day and um, I find it that it's, it's best if I, cause I'd find myself thinking of like a scene on the way to work in my car or something. And I'd be going, oh, that's a great way to do that scene. Even if it's like the finale climax, I'm going, oh, that's a great way. Everyone come up on stage and they're all clapping. Okay, yeah. And then, ooh, and then they could hug. Oh, that's a good way to do that. That's a, oh, and that's a funny line. Literally, whatever. If I'm not even at that point in my scene, I go and I write that down. Even if it's a rough outline, I write out, um, I start by doing uh, the scene beats. You know, you write interior and all that. You write out how your scenes are going to be put. You write out the action and then worry about the dialogue last too. I feel like dialogue's always the stickiest part. What right. exactly everyone's going to say. Write the action first. Write out how your scene's going to go and make sure that, yep, okay, cool. At least I made it to the end action-wise. This all seems good. And then worry about what they'll say later because I feel like that's also where people get blocked is like, oh, was that line funny enough? We'll come back and write a joke later. You need to worry about actually getting your film out there. And for me, that's it too because I'm writing a comedy film. I'm often going, oh, that's not that funny. Okay, well, it's not about being funny right now. It's about getting plot beats. It's about having the character arcs, making sure I'm hitting these things. You can come back and rewrite later, but you can't rewrite if there's nothing to rewrite, if there's nothing to edit. Yeah, I agree on that, man. Good stuff, too. Great information, great information. I, I, so, I learned ah. that because I would often be able to, anytime someone would say, hey, can you, give me an, can you read my thing and give me a, advice? I would read it, be able to edit it. And, you know, can you, when you read someone else's thing, you can always kind of point out the couple of things that you notice could be adjusted. And then mm -hmm. I go, man, I'm a pretty good writer. I noticed these things. Well, why haven't I written anything? Okay, I just need to write something. Just get it out there. Just get your first draft out there. And then if I, if because I can see I can edit other people's things, I just can, can read my draft after that and edit that. So. It's kind of just never being afraid to just write and get your first draft out there. Right. Nice. Your first draft is always going to be your worst thing. So, hey, don't worry about it being your worst thing. Just put it out. And then, I mean, worst case scenario, you just put it out as is. But, I mean, hopefully you wouldn't, hopefully you wouldn't do that. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, that's, yeah, it's been a big thing for me is, like, I'm on, like, a, a, the editing phase, rewriting phase. I've had to scrap entire scenes and stuff where you're like, no, that doesn't work now. And it's like, that's fair. Don't, that's also the thing is I, I kind of realized later on in my film, uh, something contradicted an entire scene early on. And yeah. I didn't oh, let that man. ruin. I just kept going. Cause I, when I like this idea better, I'll go back and rewrite that part another day though. I got to leave it. Like, don't stress about small things. Cause you is the bigger, you're, you're the only one who's working on this with your mind in that way of like, you you know you'll remember you'll you'll read yeah. your script you'll catch it there you go yes sir man appreciate it for the advice man Hell yeah. Uh, yeah. last thoughts man last question what does bradley want to accomplish before this year's over with Ooh. okay before we this only year's got over like with. we only got like three months well two, and a two half. months and a half <laughs> right <laughs> um well, I've got a good amount of uh, YouTube videos that I'm wanting to make, Halloween movies, Christmas movies, uh, mm. that sort of thing, because these times are coming around. Other than that, though, my a big project I'm working on, I'll say my kind of uh, magnum opus, I'm, I'm working on a second channel that I'm going to start, and it's going to be a I'm going to have, I'm working on a big kickoff video. I'm nice. trying to, um, I'm going to try to do 
stand-up comedy album special reviews and be a channel that reviews stand-up comedy specials and like literally like reviewing everyone that comes out because no one does that consistently no no one does and that's a great idea and i'm gonna start by my first video i want to be ranking every comedy special from 2022 I'm doing just a big mm -hmm. video and that being my first thing that i come out with so people can get a good idea of comedy i like what i thought was good what i thought was, wasn't good people can know my vibe my rankings my 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 thoughts and so i've been chipping away watching those and putting down my thoughts penning them um yeah that's my that's my big goal for the end of the year is to finish watching all those and actually get to recording my video on that um because yeah it's it actually has been a very strong year for comedy i've been i've been pleasantly yeah. surprised yeah uh, yeah. But I'm really looking forward to getting into, uh, apparently, Snoop Dogg dropped a stand-up comedy special. I'm like, that sounds fun. <laughs> I want to see does. Snoop do some stand-up. I, 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 I actually watched that one. It was it was pretty good. That's, it sounds fun. Anything Snoop does is always just yeah. a fun time. It's like, Anything. right? It's like, you can't just not smile with that man. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, man. <laughs> That's a bad dog impression. <laughs> oh man well yeah man there you have it ladies and gentlemen bradley smith thank you again for joining us bro many blessings to you like i said we're gonna be working with each other in the near future i already know it oh yeah you know these things are <laughs> oh yeah we'll be seeing each other again yeah man, and hey big chris mike it was great meeting you guys too oh man thank you thank you it was great meeting you too yeah man so there you have it ladies and gentlemen bradley smith so. Thanks, everyone. Just Ooh. acting up.